this will do. Okay, guys. All right. So, so we'll start now. Uh, first of all, thank you all for uh, joining us. Um, you know, this. Uh, I think this COVID has really hit us all, and I think what we're trying, all of us trying to do, is trying to stay productive and trying to stay engaged. And I think that's the silver lining. Um, at least for me, I've, I've never been more connected to people. Uh, I think um, kind of using these kind of platforms have has been super. And uh, I know I do. And um, so this. Um, so just to give you a background of the background or uh, the background on all of this, um, the series of events is sort of inspired by kind of our desire to really um, get at the heart of uh, economic um, inequity and uh, highlighting certain areas like food, for example, today, but also education. And the interesting thing about these items is that uh, they're both uh, the symptoms and the cause of equity. And I think traditionally, perhaps it's been a attack from a very siloed standpoint. And, and even a holistic viewpoint is, I think, um, um, you know, uh, not necessarily the right way to look at it. So the way we look at it is more from a capital market standpoint uh, to kind of call things for what they are, which is basically capital and money really rule everything. And if you're doing good social work, if you're doing work that kind of alleviates the social inequity, I think it's, it's paramount that you, you all understand how economics works and how capital markets flows into that as well as finance. Um, so it's a bit awkward, <laughs> but uh, we're gonna try to attempt to kind of bridge these two people doing this work on an everyday basis, or if you're just interested in it as just the average citizen, um, it's, it's very important to understand because I think this is sort of the missing link in all this. And you know, just a quick background on me, I spent a long time on Wall Street. So I am kind of um, an, a prime example of, of all the things that are perhaps wrong with the world. And since uh, the people who know how to utilize capital have access to capital, have been primarily using it for their own benefit, right? And uh, it's not necessarily my fault, <laughs> not to blame myself, um, but that's just the construct, right? That's what I'm paid to do. I think that's the problem, right? So people in the system, even though you are well-meaning and you're a good person and you have morality kind of fused into your DNA, uh, your job dictates otherwise. I think that's the a lot of the, um, you know, kind of the, the cognitive dissonance that exists in a lot of people who are in this business. Um, and the this attempt is to try to bridge that gap and see what we can. All right, so that's a long kind of preamble. And of course, today we have two we can talk about in terms of work that they're doing on an everyday basis. One is a for profit, the other is a non profit, and the for profit is a B Corp. It's a super interesting organization, Red Rabbit. Um, and we're going to get to that a little bit later. But before we get to that, I'm going to go to hopefully these slides are moving. But uh, as you can see, it's great. And my screen is not showing, but uh, I'll just kind of talk through it if you can't see the screens anyway. So it's the 50th, 50th anniversary of Earth Day. Um, so um, I put this little funny slide in here. Um, but then why is Michael Moore not happy, right? Because he just released a movie uh, yesterday that kind of talks about all the failings of Earth Day. And he has a legitimate point, right? If you agree with him or disagree with him, I think the, the point is empirically correct. And this is what we're gonna talk about today. And hopefully this is gonna be a series of to go to kind of uh, really dissect uh, why in the last 50 years, nothing, I mean, things have gotten worse, arguably. Um, so why? Um, so here's kind of the three points in, in the slide. It's um, I think a lot of it's just treating symptoms. I think uh, we as human beings have a tendency to just focus on what's obvious and not necessarily tackling the underlying disease or the disease, diseases, you know. Um, so that's one we're gonna talk about today, some part of it. Um, the final two points here is that, um, you know, these are just words, but I think it's super important. Um, so, uh, and these are interchangeable. I don't want to make people self-conscious about this stuff, but you know, the difference between inequality and inequity, right? Inequality implies some kind of comparative uh, viewpoint which is um, that person's rich, I'm poor, I have to bring that guy down, I have to tax him, things like that. I think it, it creates a certain mindset. Uh, I like to refer to it as more inequity, which is there's just an inherently something wrong with us. And let's focus on that rather than trying to have a comparative view, because I think that just limits our, our view of what's possible. Um, again, they'll get self-conscious where people use it interchangeably, and I understand that, but um, just to kind of highlight kind of how I'm thinking about it in terms of just how language is infused in, into these types of discussions. The second point here is that it's, uh, we talk about financial literacy because I think a lot of people talk about, well, we need to have people who perhaps are not that well off to really be financially literate. Um, I think that also kind of limits what's possible or kind of um, the solutions that are possible that addresses this, this inequity. Um, so I like to call it more financial comprehension. 
So in other words, it's, it's rather than trying to understand what, what's existing today, right? The language of finance. And uh, I can argue that a lot of it's built to just make the financial industry just more powerful and more rich, right? It's designed uh, to get more money in the system and for them to take more market share, right? It's a cartel if you think about it, right? The finance industry and, and Wall Street or whatever you want to call it is really no different than the oil business, right? It's a cartel. Um, so in my opinion, it requires more financial comprehension. You have to, beyond the language, understand what the language really means and really get deeper so that you understand exactly what's happening. And this comprehension is what's needed, the depth of understanding to really understand how we can solve this inequity. Okay, so um, uh, this one has a lot of numbers on it, if you can see the screen. So apologize for the numbers, but um, you know, uh, so I teach at, at City College and I teach a class called Applied Investing. And um, what I've noticed is that even students that have taken a lot of micro and macroeconomics, um, they learned all the mechanics of it and the thesis behind it and all that, which is wonderful. But I think uh, what's missing is perhaps it's just a, a basic visceral understanding of what really you know, economics um, really means. So here, this is, in a, if you need to understand economic inequity and economics in one page, this, this is it, okay? Mom, so uh, what I have here. Oh. I'm sorry, I only see that your lead slide. Can you, is it possible for you to get that page up? Because it's, I, can, I personally can't see it. It could be my eyes. Okay. <laughs> Is it? Oh, uh, yeah. It, yeah. I don't know why that's not. <laughs> yeah, there we go. There you go. Oh. Thank you. That's more, more very helpful. Wow, that, was, that was weird. I almost have to like refresh it. It's weird. Um, anyway, okay. Sorry. So uh, I'll just. Yes. There you go. That works. Okay. So that was the previous <laughs> slide. If, uh, I'm sure everyone didn't see it. So okay. happy 50th birthday, everybody. Um, <laughs> Michael Moore, devices, but I kind of like the guy uh, because he has such bravado. If you disagree or agree with him politically, I think he's just an interesting guy. And this is sort of, sorry. And then, yeah. oh, Thanks. yes, it works. Okay. All right, great. So, a lot of numbers, but not so much. And I tried to distill it down because, uh, because you know, uh, it's very hard to think about these things because it's, it's such a complex topic, right? Economic inequity. And there's politics, there's sociology, there's cultural issues, there's a whole bunch of stuff going on. And I think, but this is, in my opinion, the best way to illustrate what's going on from a financial standpoint. And it really illustrates the magic of compound interest, which is Einstein has described it as just it's the wonder of the world, right? And this is what I try to get across, which is, okay, here's 1980 to 2020. I picked this time frame because this is when uh, the US and the world really changed, right? This was the era in which, if you remember, if you're, you know, people like me are old enough to, understand, to uh, almost look through it. Um, um, it was a Reagan Thatcher kind of uh, movement, right? This sort of when kind of um, this group of capitalism really took over, right? Trickle down economics, whatever you want to call it, right? And the Brits really remember this very well because this was uh, Thatcher trying to take down public um, uh, systems, right? Same idea is that capitalism works and really the private sector should run everything, right? I'm, I'm grossly oversimplifying, but that's basically was the argument. So here, since 1980, the last 40 years, um, these are sort of the average, what's called CAGR, compounded annual uh, growth rate. So since that time, average income of the US, and this is uh, non-adjusted in terms of inflation. I know I'm seeing a lot of economic work they're probably putting you to sleep, but this is kind of important to kind of uh, get across. Uh, so this is just like dollars, right? Um, so average income in the US has grown at 3.7%, right? which is like, oh, that's pretty good. Um, you want to think. Uh, U.S. GDP growth, which is just let's say the broad economy, right? The production aspects of the U.S. economy, both from a services standpoint and from a manufacturing standpoint, has grown at 5.2%. And uh, the third point here is the S&P 500, which I consider just corporate profits, right? These are the 500 largest companies in the world, and they're kind of effectively profitability. And that generally, if you think about the stock market, Stock market values have generally tracked profitability growth, right? There's some changes of valuation here and there, but generally speaking, it's very similar, right? Highly correlated. And a corporate earnings in terms of large businesses, like the biggest 500 largest companies in the world, have grown at 8.3%. So you may think, well, what's the difference? That seems about right, and what's the big deal? Uh, here's what's the big deal, right? In the last 40 years, if you compound this over time of 40 years, and let's say you index it, let's say 1980, just $100, right? just to put a just a dollar amount that's sort of a, a, a similar place to start. If you see uh, by 2020, the average income went to basically $428, right? That, that's again, uh, I'm gonna adjust it for inflation in the second and the lower part. 
uh, yes, GDP growth, it, then it's uh, $760, right? So that's how much it, it's equivalent to how much it has grown, right? If you use 100 as the baseline for 1980. S&P 500, and this is where it makes a difference. You may not think 3.7% is any different than 8.3%, right? It doesn't seem like that much. Compounded over 40 years, you have a six-fold difference of value, right? So that's a magic of compound interest. In that last little section, what I have is real dollars, right? Which is then I try to uh, I adjust it for inflation, right? So inflation, if you don't know what that concept is, everyone thinks is rising prices. It's really deflation. It's really your currency getting less value, right? That's really what's happening, right? So we have to account for this dilution that's happening in our currency that erodes the value of our dollar, right? That's what's really inflation is just the, the flip side of that argument. So anyway, so if you adjust for inflation, we have been roughly 3% in this country for the past 40 years. The average income is only $132, right, in constant dollar terms, right? So it has grown, but not that much. U.S. GDP growth has more than doubled, right? So that's kind of the overall economy, right? That's including corporates and stuff like that, right? The entire economy has is doubled that, right? And here's corporate profits, right? Here's the corporate wealth, right? Uh, six, basically six times what an average American makes, right? So hopefully this, this clarifies it, right? This is a very quick way of saying, like a quick hand way of saying, why is this happening? It's by design, right? Something compounding at 8%, right? Companies just getting more profitable and just generating corporate growth at 8% versus someone who's, whose income is only growing at three and it's been less in the last couple of years, by the way, it's been like 2%. And real wages in the last five or so years has been basically zero, right? So, this is a simple way to explain it. The average person is flat, and the richest companies in the world are still growing at an exponential rate. And the problem that's been happening in the last 10 years is that technology times capital just puts this on just you know a rocket ship. Um, because you can leverage technology with capital is creating an accelerating equity, right? Because these companies can get just even more powerful, right? The best example, of course, is like a Facebook, right? They know what you think. They know what you do. They know your behavior. Google does as well. And they can use that effectively against you. Or that's a harsh way of saying it. It's more to manipulate you, right? <laughs> Sounds worse. Um, but to monetize you, right, uh, is what's happening. Okay, so I'm going to go over these two things quickly. Uh, so COVID-19, basically, if you look at, if you have a question of all these kind of stimulus measures, right, that's been passed, like this 2.2 trillion plus an additional 500 billion. I know the numbers sound mind-bogglingly large and they are. What's really happening, I'm sure you kind of intuitively understand it, is that it's just basically wealth transfer, right? What the Federal Reserve is doing effectively, right, is saying, I have a blank check, right? The Federal Reserve can print as many dollars as it wants, right? It's a lender of last resort, but also the creator of currency of last resort. They can do whatever they want, right? Um, so in that sense, what they're really doing is they're, it's not a corporate bailout. That's not really, I think, explaining the extent of it, right? What they're really doing is basically buying their assets from them. I'll give you a second example, right? Let's say you're a, a tenant, let's say commercial or a, let's say living in an apartment, you can't pay your rent, right? Then of course, then the, now the landlord then is hurt, right? Because they're not collecting rent and they have to then pay their mortgage, right? That's on, on that property. Um, so the, the landlord gets hurt, right? But let's say if these loans default, what the Fed is saying to the actually the owners of those mortgages, right? The actual capitalist behind all these real properties is that I'll just take it off your hands at hundred cents of a dollar. So they're fine, right? We're still hurting, right? The person still lost their job. The landlord himself is also perhaps defaulting on their loan, but the capitalist is fine, right? That's like, you, I think everyone kind of intuitively understands that, but once I explain it that way, it kind of makes sense, right? Those are the mechanics of what's happening. Of course, workers are getting wages, right? This sort of the paycheck protection plan, right? These things are helping offset income losses. But just think about it, that person is still out of work. And will that job come back in the next three, six months? Probably not, or who knows, right? It's going to be slow. So that person permanently has lost wages and has lost the job and now has to get back on the workforce and get back on the treadmill. Whereas the capitalist is fine. I've, I've just effectively saying, thank you, Fed. You've, you've taken this off my hands or you've actually stopped me out, right? So that's what's really happening, right? Um, so again, capital wins at the, at the partial expense of labor. This is not a pure wealth transfer, but labor is getting something, people are getting something, but the vast majority of dollars are just helping the capital markets, right? People who actually own these assets and, and own capital. And of course, coming out of this, technology will even be stronger, right? Because we're relying on these things. I mean, literally what we're doing today. Um, you know, these companies will have even more leverage going forward. 
so just to kind of follow up on that. Um, so it, it just in this COVID-19 just exacerbates this inequity, right? So what's happening here is that, of course, if you're small businesses, right, there's a couple of programs that are there to kind of help you with um, um, uh, if you're a small business and, and, and uh, you know, have to shut down or whatever. But it's really what's happening is that on a relative basis, large companies will just get stronger, right? So if you want to understand why the stock market hasn't collapsed by 50%, this is why. Right? And capital markets intuitively understands that these large companies, this S&P 500, these global companies, are just going to get stronger out of this. Right? Of course, they're going to get hurt as well. Um, but in the long term, they're just going to get stronger. Right? Small businesses and people get hurt more from this because they have less capital. Right? They're just living pay to, paycheck to paycheck. More small businesses have the balance sheets. Um, they're also going from literally you know, month to month in terms of their revenues and their costs. Uh, but big companies have massive balance sheets and they can weather this. Of course, the caveat is that if there is a rebound effect and there is kind of a, a knock-on effect, economic effect of this, then everyone gets hurt, right? Um, but the point of the here is that large companies can weather that much better than any of us could. And of course, rich people as well, right? Um, because then this allows, again, if, if you have a company who has capital, then when, when things, you know, it's the old Rothschild saying, right? So you, you buy when there's blood in the streets, right? When there's blood in the streets, you can buy assets that's cheaper than you ever had put before. And again, the, the strong gets stronger. Um, small businesses get hurt, and of course, we all know intuitively and you know viscerally in front of our eyes. If you're a minority, if you're poor, you're just getting just decimated right now uh, for for various reasons uh, beyond just financial. So um, sorry to be so dour. <laughs> so you know, a broke transition. Um, so this is funded or sponsored by the newly formed City College Sustainable Investment Fund Club. It's a student club. I'm the faculty advisor. But everyone's welcome, right? So I, I welcome all of you to join us. Uh, it's not an official club yet. We'll be official in the fall, but we want to get this kind of movement going. And the whole idea is that this, this notion that um, let's rethink how we're going to solve this economic inequity, right? Let's, uh, let's really think about how if you try to, so this is what I try to explain to, to my students, is if you try to be an activist and, and, and try to pursue social good, um, that's fantastic. The problem is you're fighting against the quote unquote enemy, uh, let's say people with money and capital, who may not be bad people, and, and the vast majority of them are not, right? But if you attack them, they're going to react a certain way, like any human being does, right? So it's probably not the best way to go forward because the problem is they have all the money and power, right? Just to be really blunt about it, right? Um, I know there's always a debate about money versus power, but I can guarantee you from my seat, it, it's all about money, right? Money buys power, so therefore it's always that sequence. So that's the world, unfortunately. Sorry about it. Um, I didn't make it. I didn't make this world. It's just the way it is. And it, it requires if you truly want to make an impact, you have to understand this. Um, so then the question becomes then how do you use that to your advantage? So I think that's I think a lot of people have a, just a moral, um, I think, a distaste for that. I think, um, but I think this is the stuff, this is the leap that you have to make, in my opinion, um, to really make a social impact. Uh, the third point is a, it's a really dumb economic point, which is a, what's, what's called Pareto efficient. Pareto efficient just means that no one gets hurt. Right? So whatever you do has to be a positive or neutral outcome for everybody, or else things don't move. Now, this doesn't mean that things inherently become less inequitable. Uh, it just means that if you have this mindset, you're just, your, your point of view is not to take people down, right? You're, it's an, in, an inherent uh, realization that uh, you have to bring people along, otherwise they'll fight against you, especially uh, an adversary or the other side, people who have capital who are rich, who are uh, going to fight against you, right? Um, because you're just attacking them, right? Or at least, at least they're, they perceive you attacking them, which is also a very human reaction. So, um, uh, so ch change is possible. <laughs> so I'll just give you one example of uh, just art, right? Uh, a piece of art that trades for $100 million really inherently has no value, right? Um, but it actually does because then, uh, let's say an auction house like Christie's makes a commission off that, right? There's a, um, you know, an art dealer that also makes money off it. Um, there's a whole ecosystem that, that's below this entire art ecosystem that, that generates money because an asset value has been set, right? That thing has been sold for hundred million and that sets up a chain of economic activity that actually generates GDP. But art itself is not uh, generating anything, right? It's not producing any goods. And you could argue that the social good can be something similar, right? Why can't we generate GDP value, quote unquote, uh, from something that the market values? 
And once you create that asset value, then you can actually create GDP value. Um, so my whole, whole point is that, and if you want to have this discussion uh, further, please join the club and let's talk about these things and I'm gonna try to get my point across. Um, the whole point is, is that um, the, um, the entire economic system is built upon this notion that it has to pursue the highest ROI or otherwise the whole economic system collapses. But my point is that, well, that's the, that seems very uh, definitive, but it is not, right? A lot of things add value, economic value, and it's not always creating, quote unquote, the best product, right? And that's, I think, a, a, a false argument. Okay, uh, we're getting to the home stretch. This is my incredibly elegant uh, transition to our talk today, <laughs> which is, um, uh, my big point here is that uh, money and capital, uh, they're not amoral, they're, um, yeah, it's amoral, it's not immoral, right? It's just a tool. It's a tool. Um, so what I like to get across is that, um, you know, um, money is like food, right? It all depends on how it's cooked, right? And I think right now, if you, especially if you're a younger generation and you really, this is all you know, right? So I truly appreciate the point of view from a, a typical, like one of my students, right? Uh, from a Gen Z perspective, all you've known is sort of this inequity and uh, uh, environmental uh, problems and all that, right? That's, that's, what you've known for the past 10 plus years. Uh, but what I try to get across to, for, for some of that point of view is that, you know, we all need food, so, but don't reject food just because you don't like the way it's, it's cooked, right? Because our current cooks suck, as I say here, right? The people who've been cooking suck because it's only been for their benefit, right? What, we, what we're I'm really trying to get across is that we need to change how the food is cooked, right? Uh, because we all need food, right? We all need capital that has to be there. Um, so, and the last point is that, and this is where kind of where we all can be involved. We all need to learn how to cook, right? And this is my very crude attempt to how to get this thing started. We all need to understand how economics works, finance works, how money works, how capital formation works, right? All this stuff I think has to be at the base level of what every citizen should know. Um, and so that's my very elegant uh, transition to what we're going to talk about today. Um, so one of the areas that we're going to talk about uh, going forward is, is food and how that's both, uh, as I said before, a symptom and a cause of inequity. So today with us, um, we have two experts that are doing uh, this on an everyday basis and, and doing it in scale, which is super interesting. Uh, the first is, is uh, Nancy Easton. She's the uh, founder and CEO or executive director, sorry, of Wellness in the Schools. And I'll let her kind of talk about her organization. And Nasher Khan, um, who's, uh, I think, head or VP of Strategic, a relationship with Red Rabbit, uh, which serves, I think, 30,000 meals uh, per day in, in schools in the, the tri-state area. So I'll just kind of be quiet now and I'll let um, uh, our two panelists kind of introduce themselves and say a little bit about their organization. Thank you, <laughs> thank you, Nasher. Um, so you you texted me. Am I still having an echo? Am I? Is my okay? Good. My microphone works. It could have been my twelve year old coming up to use the shower. Um, <laughs> so thank you for that education, Paul. I took my own notes, and I'm glad I was able to finally to see your slides. And um, I want to start by saying two things. One, thank you. Thanks for having me. I am. I, as you, it's, I think it's in my bio, I am a teacher first before I got into any of this. And I, I have been, I've been in a few conversations lately and I keep saying that I, I miss the teaching. So I'm hoping, I, unfortunately I can't see your students, but I wish I could. And I'm glad to be a little bit of a teacher here, but normally when I talk, I don't like, I don't, I don't talk at. Um, so I hope there is time for, for conversation um, at some point in this. So thank you for having us. And then a second thing, just listening to you talk, I, I want to say it's why I always enjoy my conversations with you as a small, as someone who runs a small nonprofit, I'm always thinking out of the box about how to grow and how to raise dollars. And, and you are definitely, um, helpful to get me out of that box. You're definitely not in that box of the of traditional fundraising 101. So I, I think it's important first just to share very briefly because we are now all in sort of not normal times, right? Uh, post COVID times, but what wellness in the schools does during normal times. I want to sort of seize that opportunity since I have this platform, if you don't mind. Um, so we are, as I said, a small nonprofit based in New York City, but we are an international organization and we, um, I really look at this work, and, and you didn't mention the word obesity at all, but um, really 
through the lens of the childhood obesity epidemic and how uh, poverty and obesity are linked. So it is all fully, of course, intertwined. And we're seeing so much more, of course, now during COVID, um, not necessarily obesity, but certainly poverty and the need for food. And we're not sure and I came together and, and I'll let him take that piece is really around real food and what we're feeding children during this or in families really during this crisis and how we stepped, stepped in in a very small way. But um, essentially our, our, our normal work is to partner with schools and school districts and to bring programming that is essentially um, helping to fulfill this big bold vision to end childhood obesity. And we do that through both the fitness angle and the, and the food angle. We see both sides of that coin in order to end the epidemic. And um, when one thing I'm often saying, now that I'm using that word epidemic, is that we have entered this pandemic already in an epidemic. We are already sick, and um, that is exacerbating everything that you just talked about, right? Um, so but, but back to our work. So our work, we, we on the fitness side, we bring coaches into schools, and this is a food conversation, so I'll talk mostly about the, the food side. We hire chefs um, and train chefs and train cooks who work in schools. We first work with a district and or a school, but mostly at this point, we're at the, at the district level, uh, a district who wants to move their school lunch program towards a more scratch cooked program. And then our chefs come in, and, and that is just essentially preparing more meals, freshly prepared meals. And I'll let Nasher, um, then maybe we can go back and forth on sort of why that's important. I think it's an obvious, but um, essentially we bring cooks into schools to first help the district look at their menus, rewrite those menus. Um, I, there are levels of regulations. It's not just so easy to say, oh, let's move our menu from a heat and serve menu to a fully prepared menu from scratch. Layers of bureaucracy, as you said, layers of barriers to do that. Um, but we work with the district level to do that. Our chefs come in and train those cooks, and it's an it's an upfront training. And um, we we actually start all of those trainings with the one question of how the obesity epidemic has impacted you, and that puts us all on the same level. And then it that truly helps us to teach cooks to better stock broccoli. What student out there when they say the food sucks? Um, when broccoli is overcooked, yes, it sucks. But when it's prepared perfectly it's it's delicious and healthy and, and right now just a little plug one a very important to build your immune system during this epidemic so uh, i i digress um our chefs we train school cooks up front outside of the kitchens in a beautiful setting to help support them as human beings and as chefs um, and then we are in schools a follow-up you know from one day a week to five days a week really working on continuing with that training. It's not just a one-shot three-day training and then we leave. Um, so that they are preparing more freshly prepared, delicious meals for children. Um, and additionally, we have an education component where those same chefs are teaching children in the classroom um, simple cooking class classes. I'm tying into a, a bit of what you said. Simple, uh, basic cook cooking classes. Um, so, and all of the recipes are recipes that are in the cafeteria. So we're making the link. They say it's delicious. Then we say, well, guess what? You can get it on your menu on Friday. Um, so we're really helping to promote the consumption of these more freshly prepared meals. So that is what we do in normal times. Um, and to your point, and to um, we are treating symptoms. Um, we are not, I mean, sorry, we are tackling <laughs> I'm looking at your points, the underlying disease by being preventative, by, by helping to teach children and to feed children and families, um, to teach children the, the power of, of real food and to help create habits that are healthy habits for a lifetime of health. I can go into why I think the problem is here later. I, I think uh, the quick pivot, which will be my, my, my pivot and segue over to Nasher, is that when this epidemic happened, the day school closed, I think the minute schools closed, we received calls from longtime partners like Nasher to say, what can we do? You know, we are a small for-profit, but we're a small business, obviously businesses for profit. Um, and we have been feeding children for all these 15 years as well. I grew up in the space with the founder of Red Rabbit with Reese. Um, and we grew up together, you know, solving problems together and working in the space together. And he said, you know, our normal clientele, their schools are closed. Where can we fill in the gaps? So we just hit the ground running, call our, you know, we in touch with all of our families and schools and saying, where are their needs? And um, our philosophy in all of this, when the donor comes to me right now during COVID is 
you know, let's we can channel or we can pass through your your donor dollars to small food businesses who are supporting local local farms, who are supporting the the real food and not providing just simply shelf stable food. And so the idea is that if, in doing that, when we come out of this on the other side, we will not be we're already going to be three steps backwards, five ten steps backwards in the in the in this food system that is already broken, um, but hopefully our little efforts to support businesses like Red Rabbit um, will help us to be instead of five steps or 10 steps backwards, two and a half steps or five steps. So I'll end there because um, I, I know Nasha has a lot to say and I, and I then hope to be able to have a dialogue and answer some questions. Thank you, Nancy. And I, I think you wonderfully sort of articulated where Red Rabbit and um, Wellness in the Schools, you know, sort of interest really intersect. Thank you, Paul, for naturally arranging this, and thank you for all who are in attendance today. Um, so just a very quick bio about what Red Rabbit is and what we do. And uh, so, like Nancy said, we we set up about 15 years ago as a to answer a social call to action, essentially, and that was how do we reorient the interaction that children primarily from lower income communities have with healthy food and how do we provide them with this food on their table uh, that they otherwise might not get such easy access to and that started this sort of thought process of okay can we register as a non-profit can we register as a for-profit organization and if so what is our business model and i think we decided yeah we decided to go for a for-profit uh, limited liability model where and working towards becoming a benefit corporation so really ensuring that every single aspect of our operations whether it is our mission uh, whether it is you know our supply chain they all embody the spirit that we are really born out of uh, out of the social necessity and out of this call to action so you know snowballing one school at a time 15 years ago literally starting with one school and and you know, a few dozen students to, to now where pre-COVID we were serving approximately between 25 and 30,000 children in just under 200 schools on a daily basis and you know majority of, of our operations are taking place with children who are uh, kindergarten through the eighth grade so we found that that's an optimal age to be able to come in provide exposure to these children on healthy food and give them access to food that they otherwise might not have readily available for them outside of the four walls of school and slowly start to sort of rewire those synapses of how they perceive how they view not only just school food but healthy food and i think you know second to nancy's point about so what is the value of broccoli and i think that's a, a really nice microcosmic uh, embodiment of of really what it is that we're trying to do you overcook it and you know it, nobody likes the taste of it you undercook it and it's again you know not really palatable so where is the where is the thin balance between what is delicious and what is nutritious and you know for anyone who has kids that has worked in a teaching or an administrative capacity in any school you know that children can be particularly finicky so the idea is that how do we contextualize these meals to to, to represent these children to show uh you know to to, to be reflective of, of their reality one at home but at the same time ensuring that they are nutritionally dense um, and a lot of these children that we work with currently you know, are in schools that would otherwise be under the community eligibility provision so that these are children who are eligible for free or reduced price lunches and what we have found is that they have much easier access to calorie dense or cheap calories essentially you know outside the four walls of that school so how do we supplement that and how do we ensure that at least within the four walls of the school they have access to good and healthy food now adding other complementary services such as nutrition education and um uh, you know sort of first-hand cooking classes to really round off that nutrition uh rewiring package that we're trying to do for these children we've found that our success rate has been incrementally growing further and further and further to the point where once the child now gets to the eighth grade they really have you know have a strong palate now for food that would be traditionally considered healthy whatever that word means in this current day and age so march 17th hit and essentially you know 30,000 children that we're serving on a daily basis 200 schools give or take now 
no more schools and no more children. Their need was still there. You know, they, these children were still hungry and they were institutionally reliant on these on, on our schools to feed them. But we didn't have a method of market distribution. We didn't know where to go to target these children. So I think that's where, you know, I think the product of quite a few inspiring conversations and a, a big chunk of those is happening with Nancy is, okay, now there's a further call to action here. Is we're serving these children, but now their parents who were working as part of the gig economy are also furloughed. Now the food insecurity is not just at the child level, it's at the household level. These individuals who were, uh, you know, already on the cusp or right above what would be called the poverty line have now, are, are now more vulnerable than ever to fall through the cracks. And the social safety net that we were hoping that the state or, you know, the city or whoever it would be, the civil society, um, would be able to step up and, 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 and enhance is not sufficient enough to catch everyone. So what is our value in contributing to that social safety net? And in that, we were able to expand our mandate to not only just focus on children, but all vulnerable populations, homeless individuals, individuals who were recently incarcerated and now have been freed because, as you know, we've all read that there's a, an unprecedented crisis happening at these, at these, at these prisons or jails. Um, you know, senior citizens, homebound individuals who have tested positive and now don't have any means to go out and get food. And we were able to put together a few multidisciplinary, multi-stakeholder partnerships uh, that allowed us to, to provide these meals, uh, leverage market forces, you know, provide these meals, work with community-based organizations who are best positioned to identify need, and then get these meals into the hands and on, onto the tables of individuals who are most in need. So I think our runway, our thought um, sort of chain is definitely catering to the needs of today with a, and I literally mean today, this is not a metaphorical today, it's, 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 a, it's a real today, you know, while also taking into account what the need will project, you know, what we're projecting the need will be tomorrow and next week and, and the months following. Because this crisis is, yes, it's affecting us today, but there are cert certain emergency measures, as we're all aware, through the Family First Coronavirus response, or today the city took, you know, a pretty proactive step in setting up their emergency uh, um, sort of relief package as well. And, you know, uh, sort of um, reformative actions such as the uh, moratorium on evictions in the city. But these are, have a shelf life on them, and they will expire. And once they do so, these individuals who were already on the cusp of that poverty line, you know, teetering on the edge of it, are much more vulnerable than they, than they were before. So they will face a compound of discrimination of insecurity, housing insecurity, income insecurity, and food insecurity. And I think it is a pretty terrible place to be for anyone to have to worry about where their next meal is going to come from. And unfortunately, I think coming out of this crisis, there will be more people than perhaps ever before who will have to face that reality or face that question. And I think partnerships like, like WITS and Red Rabbits and Red Rabbits with World Central Kitchen and the Coney Island Prep Academy and, and, and Global Charter School, amongst others, are just, again, you know, mere drops in the ocean of trying to allay that concern for so many people for whom it's becoming a reality that, that, never, that never conceived it would be a reality for them. So I think, yeah. Yeah, I do want to talk more about sort of what we're seeing out there and how it, I think your comment about today is so important because it is today. It's not it's not the metaphorical today. And every single day, as, as I know, this is everyone is saying this, but every single day looks very, very different. Um, but just a quick comment and to tie in the, uh, you know, to the economics and, and your point about, you know, this this sugary processed food being cheaper and, I, and it's important to just i want to highlight that because as sugary foods and processed foods got cheaper it's in direct correlation to obesity growing and you know a quick a tie into to, to the little bits of economy that i that i understand and what paul's saying is you know our the farm bill is really sub, subsidizing currently the three main crops um you know uh, soy corn and wheat and those three crop, crops, excuse me, are are used to feed animals in factory farms, right? And to feed um, and to produce this process, the chips, the the, the takis that we're we're all eating because they are so cheap, 
right? And and it really is a direct correlation to obesity. So that's something to think about, sort of sort of on the higher level. You know, it, it, can we do anything on the policy level? Well, can we think about you know advocating for 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 um, those subsidies to go to small local farms to then be able to produce this food to then get into the hands of a commissary kitchen like Red Rabbit and then to get in the hands of school lunch and then right. to get into the plates of of, of of humans and of, of human beings. And yes, as Nasher said, we are seeing the same thing. It's these families who both parents have to go to work because they're frontline workers, their children are home, no one has time to, to cook for them and how and so our you know even though it's been a full pivot, our our chefs and coaches who I know, you know, this this reward of theirs being in schools and helping others was stripped from them the day the day schools were closed. Um, so while the work that we're pivoting to uh, to to help these you know small small food businesses to serve others is is a, is a little bit off point, but it's certainly. It, it was really seizing on an opportunity. They have commissary kitchens, and their their the the supply was very high of fruits and vegetables, um, extremely high because the restaurants were closing. So we, we the idea was to like get these fresh produce to these commissary kitchens that are safe and clean and and have strict COVID practices that can use this food to get to others. Um, I'm sure you've all read about farms tilling over the produce now because the food banks can't take this, the, the, the milk, schools are closed, so where's all the milk going? They can't take the, they can't sort the fruits and vegetables because they don't have the volunteer staff that they used to have. There are layers and layers, and I, I heard this morning that these food, the, the food banks, it's uh, they've doubled from 40 million family people using and um, using their services to now 80 million, and it's and I'm that's what we're hearing certainly from the field. I was on a call yesterday where um, a group in Camden on a given Saturday they would serve a thousand pounds of produce. They served one, they gave out 100,000 pounds of produce last Saturday, and the cars were lined up. He, he the gentleman who shared the story. Uh, arrived to work at 6:45. They were starting to serve at seven, and they were already. He counted. There were already 36 cars lined up to receive, and it ends up being 100,000 pounds of produce. So I'm sharing these stories to show kind of the today, right? What <laughs> day one there was just tons of abundance, and but people weren't sure sort of where it's where it goes, and and what is this, what are the systems in each city to get food out to people, and. Um, I'm talking too much, but in schools there were different methods. There was the bus routes in in Norwalk, for example. They started to, to deliver at bus routes. They thought that would be safe, and then guess what? Bus drivers started getting sick. One bus driver passes away. I mean, it's it's serious, serious stories, um, and there there certainly be, and without blame, there wasn't a particular infrastructure to help uh, solve this. Um, we've never seen anything like this. But I am proud to say that so many have rallied, and, I, and this is not just to shout us out. I've seen so much in our city and in the cities that we work in and in the donors that we work with to really rally, um, again, without a roadmap and without a system. But our little system of, of helping to support, um, you know, to get fresh food to, to the, the, the plates of, of our constituents and others through partners like Red Rabbit has been one that we feel, you know, proud to be able to do even a teeny, teeny bit of this work. That's a great point. Andrew. So my question to both of you guys um, is, if you can just step back a little bit and look beyond just today, and let's say, let's not even say tomorrow, let's just say six to 18 months from now, of the things that you're learning now, just in this brief period of time when this has been happening, right? let's just say six weeks, four, six weeks or whatever, um, are there things that, that you've learned that, that we all as a community can implement, just as an average person or someone who's actually in this kind of area, are there kind of things that come to mind that kind of, hey, we can actually, on the, climb out to the other side of it, we can actually do something about this and actually structurally change something. Nasha, do you want to go since I just finished blabbing? <laughs> uh, sure. And I think actually this is funnily enough a conversation that Nancy and I were having earlier as well about nobody naturally could fathom the impact and, and the scale of, of, of our current pandemic. However, you know, with Hurricane Sandy, and you know, uh, we've we've had certain jolts to the system as a city that have really 
uh, kicked into us the fight or flight response. And as as a city, as as, as a people, it's it's a very resilient community, as Nancy was saying. Um, what I think what one thing that, that that we're lacking as is a cohesive centralized response to what would happen if tomorrow something like this happens again particularly from a feeding perspective our infrastructure currently whether it be shelters or um you know a community sort of feeding operations is just not prepared to be able to handle the volume or uh, handle the supply chains that would come from from such an event i mean they're extremely well-meaning well-intentioned uh, individuals working there but a lot of them rely on volunteers and you know, anecdotally, I can tell you, we were serving about 300 families at, at a NYCHA site in Manhattan, relying on volunteers to meet our last mile distribution needs, so about six, seven of them. And then one day, one of them tests positive for COVID, and then the whole team is, is essentially you know, out of commission for the next two weeks. But the needs of those 300, 300 plus families are still there tomorrow. And, but unfortunately, we did not have the last mile distribution to be able to do so. So I think that that centralized planning, that long term, that foresight required to ensure that, OK, now that we have we understand that a pandemic of, of this nature could could come in again. And our last mile distribution, you know, our door to door contactless, contactless delivery might be seriously affected. What type of emergency measures can we should should we put into place that can go into effect on, on a moment's notice to ensure that uh, you know, these individuals who are homebound or potentially would be homebound 18 months from now as well can still get fed. So there are phenomenal organizations like City Meals on Wheels and God's Love We Deliver that have that infrastructure. But again, there are infrastructure caps on it. So I think this really, um, this moment or this crisis has highlighted the need for multidisciplinary partnerships where corporates, civil society, uh, and, and the government really, you know, expanding the role of what that public-private partnership would be to, to really ensure that what, where is the strength of the private sector as well and what can be leveraged or pivoted at a moment's notice to adapt uh, to meet the needs of, of, of the community. Similar to what um, I think GM is doing and Tesla is doing in the making of ventilators. You know, they never did that before, but they're doing it in order to meet the, the call to action, in order to meet the demand. I think that type of mapping as an exercise at a, at a city and maybe a regional sort of food hub level needs to take place. And uh, it needs to be a collaborative and participatory process that really feel, makes all the stakeholders feel that they have equity in, in ensuring that you know those who can, that, the, that food is getting on the table of those who would need it six or 18 months from now. Um, so I think, yeah, that last mile distribution and then on, on uh, further upstream, the funding portion of it, reallocation of where donor dollars, where city dollars, where corporate dollars would have to go, and what you know, what are the established pipelines that they could plug into, um, would be a, I think, a, a very fruitful exercise for um, for any projected, hopefully, impact or jolt to the system that could fall, whether it be 18 months or five years or 10 years or whatever. Mm -hmm. I, I punted that to you, Nasha, because I didn't really have an answer. And um, the truth is, with uh, you know the, the, those the words that are being thrown around, uncertainty, unknown, it's just true. And I, I, the, to pretend that I could have an answer for what's going to we can do nine months from now, eighteen months from now, would be. Um, although you did you did a great job, Nasha, and I think the word partnership is a really important one. And um, also, just I want to say that you know from crisis does can come opportunity and innovation, frankly. And, you know, the example that I gave of the farm bill came out of, you know, economic crisis. And it was at the time created to, to subsidize, you know, small farms, you know, things always go in this interesting way sometimes, but, um, and the works projects, right? Roads were built out of, out of economic, you know, uh, poor times, right? So I think, I'm hoping that the innovation will come from someone sitting as a student right now in your class um, and that we can have um, more solutions. We will have solutions for coming out of this. And you gave a good example, Nasher. But um, I would be remiss if I didn't point out sort of, and then this could be, this is in my solution talk, um, the role of schools you know, we, and school districts. And we work with so many. And um, 
they, you know, New York City held out for a very long time to close schools. Why? Because 75% of the families in New York City live below the poverty level, and they are acutely aware that when these schools shut down, so does this, uh, you know, whole system, how to, you know, child care, um, you know, agencies that work in those schools, and then most importantly, food. And we're seeing this now, not only children, um, but their families. Um, New York City did, did an amazing job. They kept open all 1,700 schools for food for them to come and get their meals. And, um, you know, and then eventually after a couple of weeks moved to the summer feeding program, which works typically, but now that if you can't leave your house, it's very, very difficult. So that's why groups are, are you know, coming in to fill the gaps. But my the point I want to make is the school lunch program is a federally funded program. And that is there, I think there's opportunity there for when we come back. These are, I mean, I, I wanna give a huge, huge thank you and shout out to all the school cooks around this country who never imagined themselves to be called frontline workers. And they are out there risking their lives and feeding um, families, not just children, as you all know. And, um, and so in terms of the future is what can we do as individuals and as a as a government to support this federal feeding program and it's certainly with dollars it's certainly training dollars to go to training which is you know a, a shameless plug here but we're going to be so many steps backwards with this emergency feeding um, um, and you know we, we have fewer dollars we have now getting used to shelf stable <laughs> ingredients and so in terms of our work of freshly prepared meals that will be so far behind so we we need to to support even more this federal agency, this operation that feeds 32 million families a year, mostly poor families, um, and how to support them to, to continue to pre to prepare freshly prepared meals, um, because that is is the is in my opinion the solution for a stronger and healthier future. Um, so it's again, it's bottom up. It's supporting those, and 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 you know, every child who eats at school is a dollar for for that district, right? And it's also actually it's just one dollar. So the point here is, how can government um, come in and make that dollar more, um, so that we can provide training and we can provide um, more freshly prepared meals for children? Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's. You know, it's, it's hard to have these discussions and not talk about other systems that are failing, like healthcare, right? I think we're in, in, a, in a richest country in the world and with such amount of food waste. Mm -hmm. uh, it's amazing that we even have the situation, right? even pre-COVID, right? And people were starving mm -hmm. pre-COVID and now it's just kind of, I think, highlighting it even more of, of things that already existed. Mm -hmm. And I think that, that just intuitively doesn't make any sense, right? So I think that's, this is where I think uh, hopefully the younger generation can figure it out where it, all the elements are there. I think all the incentive systems are there. And the, and the simple naive question is, what the hell's wrong? Right? Like, why can't companies um, see kind of an economic benefit to helping out, right? Because they have such amount of food waste. They have such an unlimited resources. And uh, being charitable does not mean necessarily an expense item, right? I think there's a way to make this quote unquote profitable, right? If you look at it in a different way, I mean, you can actually probably make it economically uh, uh, profitable as well but from a branding standpoint from an employee retention standpoint from a elevating the culture of the organization standpoint there are other ways in which it's less measurable um, that this type of work is quote-unquote economically beneficial right quite self-serving because I, I honestly believe that everything has to be self-serving otherwise it's just not sustainable right you can't rely on charity it's just very hard to sustain that behavior for most people especially if you have the means um, we're kind of running a lot of time, so I'll just we'll just finish with one last question, and I'll try to be a little bit controversial. So, again, when you're when you're doing your everyday work and we're taking a, yes, when you're taking a step back, if you were to you know again, uh, I will absolve you of all fault in what you're saying, what you're going to say for the next five or to fifteen minutes, which is, what's the real problem? Who's the who's the bad guy, right? If you were to just at a human level, right? If you were to point to the biggest obstacle or the biggest just intuitively. What would you say is the biggest problem out there that's causing this thing that's needless, the sort of food insecurity and people literally starving every day and families who, who you know, food should be kind of a given right, right? Especially in a, in a country of this wealth that we have here. 
what, what's the problem? <laughs> <laughs> That's not sure. Um, I'm the last one to talk, but I will answer because I, you know, and you're pointing to me because you you don't want to be a, the con. I'm going to give the most diplomatic answer ever, and that is everyone. Um, you know, really starting from all of us. You know, you often hear the expression "vote with your fork," right? If we continue to purchase processed meals, um, we're continuing to support that economy. And we're continuing to say, yeah, government subsidize those three those three um, commodities. And if we continue to eat factory farm meat the way we're eating it, we are saying, sure, there's, we're making this we're, this, we're the demand for this supply. Um, if we do the opposite, if we're buying fresh foods and if we're cooking from home, then we are make the, our demand then is to subsidize these farms. So, so, so it's it's all of us. We need to to vote with our fork. We need I was gonna say we need to eat with our fork. Yes, we should do that too. Um, but we should vote with our fork. And and then of course top down, like what is being subsidized, what is being supported, um, and how can that shift? And at what a dollar amount? You know, how can we justify one dollar only for a, a healthy lunch? Uh, and then in the middle. Sort of what are the what what's corporates you know it's all you know I like I know that I hear from your your opening that we, we want to paint corporate America as the bad guy, um, you know what is their role in all of this? Where you know they're they're, they're making money off of our, our voting right of our forks. We are asking for sodas. We are you know we're we're drinking sodas, so they're going to profit off of that. Um, so I I do want to push and especially since I'm speaking to 72 young, maybe young people, or 72 students, you know, what is our role that, you know, that I want to empower you as individuals to be part of this solution, because it seems far off to make this policy change with, you know, to, to, to subsidize different kinds of crops. Um, so, you know, you can, by, by, by eating particular foods and by cooking. So I'm going to empower you with that and, and, and be very diplomatic in my answer. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> that's, that was a wonderful answer, Nancy. <laughs> um, yeah, this is, I mean, Paul, this is a tough question, and you know, naturally there is no answer that I can give that doesn't throw somebody under the bus. So um, there is, you know, there are people who deserve essentially to be thrown under the bus. Here. There are entities, there are systems that deserve to be thrown under the bus. Here. And I think when we talk about this food system, there is, uh, there's a dichotomy in this food system. There is the international one. So essentially the same market forces that are in play in sub-Saharan Africa or South Asia are not, it's, are not in play essentially, or are in play in a different manifestation here in the US. And our malnutrition also takes a very different shape and form. Right? Malnutrition, when we think about it in the international context is in undernutrition. Now, globally, we've also been starting to see, and uh, you know, naturally, it's been present in the U.S. for a while. And that's why organizations like Wellness in the Schools and Red Rabbit exist. Is that double burden of malnutrition? How is it that we have in the same country, even in the same household, sometimes those individuals who are undernourished and those individuals who are overnourished, right? And that overnourishment is coming from naturally um, resulting in obesity and, and obesity-related diseases. So the social determinants of health, I think, are something that need to be widely articulated. And that's one of those um, sort of agencies or institutions or maybe knowledge sets that needs to be, um, that that has a bigger part to play, I think, in all of this. I think community-based organization um, and community-based mobilization around food equity is also extremely important. Yeah. You know? And I think that's again where the social determination, social determinants of health, as a, as a, as a knowledge base, come in within these community-based organization setups. So organizations that are set up to, to fight for tenant rights, organizations that are set up to fight for, um, uh, you know, for housing or economic rights, those also have a for health rights have a big part to play in in dispelling any misgivings about food inequity, and adopting new mantras of what a healthy food you know, healthy food on their plate should look like. And naturally, you know, the history of struggle in the US or globally has has not been a, a passive one. It's been a very active one where organizations, grassroots campaigns have have really taken to the streets, have really, you know, have, uh, sort of coalesced around a, a very central thesis and then demanded that power, demanded that agency back from the institutions that, that have appropriated it. And I think this is no different. 
So I think desperately there are movements happening within this country and globally of people realizing and coming to terms with what ultra processed food looks like, what world healthy looks like. I mean, I can tell you coming from a country like Pakistan, all our food was organic. That was just not a thing, you know, we never had to deal with, with, with the idea of ultra processed foods. Until now, when I go back now, and I see that the, 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 the marked reality of what, what diets look like on a day-to-day -day basis is completely different from what it looked like 10, 15, 20 years ago. So I think in that play, uh, that the other agency to throw under the bus, I guess, would be giant corporates that are unfairly targeting individuals who they know don't have that you know that power of pocket and that's why their voices are underrepresented in the halls of power as well to actually you know to, to echo paul's your point that you know all of, all this power flows from money as well and that you know those with, with the least amount of money have the least amount of agency as well so they don't they don't get to say that how the the food that is being targeted towards them is is um, is affecting their day-to-day -day life and, and the quality of that life as well so i think they have a part to play and then naturally at you know again zooming out at the macro level at the policy level either uh, on a state municipal national or you know pan national level regional level that has a huge part to play you know? and, and i think on, on our individual basis it's important for us to understand the role that all these uh, entities are playing stakeholders are playing in our food system and then to ensure that our call to action that our call for mobilization is is appropriately tailored to each and every individual stakeholder where we know exactly what to ask of, of our policy makers where we know what to ask of, of, our, of our you know corporate um sort of big players where we know what to ask of, of our neighbors um and i think you know this is both um finger pointing both externally and internally and hopefully a um you know, a, a, a call to social mobilization as well. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't think there's any clear cut answer in there, but that's that's essentially how I think I would <laughs> I would tend to frame the answer for that question. Mm. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, I, I think it's interesting, right? I think it's uh, it, it is what we make of it. I think this is a, an interesting point in time. I think historically significant, and I think the future is not written, right? I think what we're all saying here is that. We can choose A or B, and uh, what better time than literally something that has stopped the planet? I mean, I, I can't think of, you know, in that sense, a better opportunity to just reset everything. Um, my fear is that we're not going to do that because we're lazy. Right? <laughs> that's my fear, but hopefully we're not. Um, and uh, and we have a choice. Right? Yeah. Absolutely. All right. Uh, well, I want to respect everyone's time. We're running a little bit over, but thank you everybody for joining us. Uh, Nancy, I'm not sure. Oh, oh, Nancy, you had something. What I said in the beginning about education and that I, I, I truly mean what I say in terms of the back and forth, and we've been talking at you for 39 minutes. Or no, when do we start? Yeah, no, an hour, sorry, an hour and nine minutes. Sorry, right, not 39. Um, but, and, and so if there are questions, please, Paul, if you don't mind them being filtered through you, and I'm happy to answer uh, any questions by email or, because I, I, I mean what I say in terms of that the, we learn more from the questions that we ask. Um, so right. happy to do that. Oh, absolutely. So uh, uh, definitely, we hope that this is just the first conversation of many, and I implore all of you on the, on the call, and hopefully there's going to be a lot of people who's going to access the replay as well. Um, so this is for their benefit when they listen to it in the future <laughs> or time traveling. Um, please, this is a conversation. So I think uh, what we want to do with Investment Fund Club, the Sustainable Investment Fund Club, is to kind of be a platform where we can get these not only conversations going, but actually do something about it, put some capital behind it, get a lot of uh, disparate uh, kind of entities uh, from individuals to corporates and really start to do something. And this is not just a student club. Hopefully it's going to be, we have very, big ambitions for what this uh, is going to be, hopefully. Um, but absolutely, Nancy, it's, uh, we want this to be a conversation that leads to action and just more thoughtful discussions. And hopefully this times a million happens all around the world. I'm, I'm hoping these types of conversations are happening as we speak around the world. I'm pretty confident that they are. And we just need to take control of this and not just rely on the existing systems that have led to where we are the past 40 years, which has been not good, right? It's only benefited very few people and they're very good at exploiting it, and they're very smart, and they can leverage capital. And we just need to 
do it for the benefit of all. Not to necessarily tear them down, but I think, um, and this is what we mean by inequity, I think it's just that there's something absolutely wrong that's going on, and we need to absolutely fix it. So thank you everybody for uh, joining us. Thank you, Nancy and the chair, and uh, we'll talk to y'all soon. Okay. Thank you all. All right. Bye, everybody. Bye. <laughs>